and welcome to another episode of Getting Heated. Welcome back everyone. Today we are going to be tackling the very nuances of heat pump installations mm -hmm. and what would be the ideal heat pump installation, which honestly in the UK seems like a bit of a difficult thing, difficult goal to it's achieve. It's very hit or miss. Yes. But there are definitely things that you can do to try and make sure that you get the best possible outcome. Yeah. And that's what we're going to try and cover today. But before we get stuck in and unravel all the little bits and pieces that are involved to get to that ideal heat pump scenario, mm -hmm. we'd like to say a huge thank you once again to Heatable for sponsoring this episode. Thank you, guys. So for me, the ideal heat pump installation actually starts with vetting and finding the ideal installer and the quotation stage for me is probably the most important. Yeah, absolutely. I think that whenever you're doing any major work on your home, I think that absolutely the best possible way to start that to make sure you get a good outcome is to screen and research as many suppliers, providers, or contractors in your area that you possibly can to make sure that right from the get-go, you're gonna be working with credible, reliable, professional people. It's all very well doing like all the other bits, like making sure that they have the right credentials, making sure that you know they, the price is right, making sure that they're gonna you know install the right machinery. But if you're dealing with uh, installers who are just really unprofessional, really unreliable, and just have a horrible reputation, then you're never gonna have a good outcome. And it does take hours, days, Potentially, days, yeah, potentially weeks of time. Speaking to people, doing a research online, checking reviews, all those kind of things. All that effort at the beginning really, really does pay off at the very end. Mm -hmm. But it is challenging, even though you said, you know, put the work in, try and find the, the right installers. I think that's a little bit easier said than done because unfortunately, there are a lot of cowboys out there still that are just getting the jobs, they're not necessarily as good as what they think they are. Mm -hmm. And they're putting in systems that, that work, but they're not you know, amazing. And let's not forget that the installer numbers in the UK are just nowhere near where they need to be anyway. For heat pumps, they're ridiculously low. Not only do you have a very small pool of people to begin with to look at, but then when you think about the ones out of that small pool that are really genuinely great and good and passionate and experienced and qualified and reliable and tick all of those boxes, which are, there are so many, mm. your pool suddenly just shrinks down to like, <laughs> I don't even know, like 10% <laughs> or something. I mean, That's it small. just goes down so tiny. I remember when we were doing a video a few years ago talking about installations and heat pump installations. And I said at the time, do your homework and basically even if that installer is you know at the other end of the country try and figure out how to get that person down to you if they've got the right reputation and you know that they've had especially an experience in a property that's very similar to yours that they had good success rate that they've got really happy customers that they've got a really good portfolio pay the extra to get an installer down to you we've had some feedback on that saying well you know you really should be looking at supporting your local installers i 100 percent agree with that on the understanding or on, on the industry actually having those installers available for you in your local area. If you don't have installers available in your local area or you have a very, very small number of installers available in your area and they are not performing or not having the good kind of reviews that you need them to have, you don't have a choice but to go further afield. So I do think homeowners, unfortunately, at this stage where we're at, with the UK industry, the homeowners have a very, very small amount of, of good installers to choose from. And what complicates the matter even further is that certain homeowners we're beginning to see now have got preconceived notions as to which heat pump brand they would like to go with. So for example, you know, there might be some that really like Samsung as a brand, so they want a Samsung heat pump or an LG or a Panasonic or a Neve or a Weissman, whatever it is. There are certain installers that only specialize in those particular heat pumps. Yeah. So if you get a word of mouth recommendation saying, you know, we had Jim come out, do our work, it was fantastic, but he put in a Panasonic, Jim probably won't undertake the work if you want to uh, put in a, a Samsung because he might not be fully up to speed with regards to how the controls for that heat pump work. Yes. So you're almost then obliged to use an installer that's going to fit a specific type of brand, mm. which to be honest, I don't think is as big a deal as, you know, as, as some people make out. It's not as if, you know, you've got affiliations towards a BMW or Mercedes kind of car, that particular brand is something that you love. I think the heat pumps, 
they all pretty much do the same thing. The controllers kind of set them out a little bit, but it is interesting to see that certain installers only like working with specific brands. We just did an interesting article on Renewable Heating Hub um, a few weeks ago about made in China heat pumps and heat pumps that are really subpar and don't have good numbers or they're claiming to have great numbers, yeah. but they in, real, in reality don't. If you're dealing with a installer who's got a good reputation or has been recommended to you and when you speak to that installer they are only willing to install a heat pump that is almost like a no-name mm -hmm. brand i would personally be very cautious of that on the other hand i think that as a homeowner if you don't have specific experience maybe for example in your previous property you did have an lg installed and you had a really really great experience with that and you really loved it i could understand why you would prefer Mm -hmm. an LG installer to install an LG as long as the brand is reputable as long as it is a top tier um, heat pump yeah. manufacturer then I think you are dealing with very similar kind of quality of heat pumps I know that there's going to be maybe some installers that hear that and just fall off their chair and say they're mm -hmm. completely different that's crazy you can't say that so from a homeowner's perspective I think that your kind of expectations would be very similar if you're talking about your installer saying well sorry I only deal with LG oh sorry I only deal with Valen oh sorry I only deal with Samsung from your perspective you know that those brands are all leading brands and you think okay it really that shouldn't become the make or break of that deal mm -hmm. I think I think you really then should be looking at okay these installers I've met they all um, install different brands which are very reputable are very well known have all the warranties and guarantees that I need and now you can really just focus on the installer and just to build on that point I think the biggest issue by going with a no-name brand or a smaller brand is that and we've seen this uh, there's been a couple of posts actually recently on the renewable heating hub forums where components have failed on those heat pumps yeah and that brand's gone out of business then you're stuck with a piece of equipment that is now no longer usable because one of the the pcb boards or something's fried yeah and you can't get a replacement for that which means that whole heat pump's got to be replaced that's very unlikely to happen if you go with a Samsung a grant or a Valence yeah. or a Grant exactly. or whatever it is with a big box brand. Those components are going to be readily available and you're not going to have to wait maybe eight weeks or nine weeks or ten weeks for a replacement part because they will be in the market already. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Heatable, who are very kindly sponsoring this episode. And they specialize in boilers, solar, and PV. Mm -hmm. uh, solar for us was, I mean, I just can't stop raving about it. Even after, what is it, nearly six years, I still think it was just the best thing we did. And I absolutely love it. And you, especially with your geek, <laughs> <laughs> with your geek side, <laughs> you absolutely love the smart control with it and knowing what's going on. And even after all these years, the novelty is still not worn off. And he will still tell me <laughs> as we're winding up for the evening. He said, do, do you know, do you know how much we, we produce today? <laughs> He's still so proud of it. So the smart controls really do help empower you as a homeowner, don't they? I think the fact that they allow you to see the amount of solar that you're actually generating and electricity that you're doing is just so amazing yeah. to be able to actually see. But equally so, I think that having a heat pump even when it's nighttime, you can still log onto the app and it's still telling you how much electricity is going out the house. Yeah. So, you know, if you don't have any smart monitoring on your particular heat pump, you can still get a very good idea as to how much electricity your heat pump is consuming just from the actual app for your solar panels, which like I said, are not actually on. We know that the baseline for our house consumes X amount of kilowatt hours per hour. So if it's doing four kilowatts, I know that the heat pump is responsible for three of those. So it's a very good way to actually be able to monitor on your phone how much electricity your house is consuming even when it's nighttime yeah. so you can see at a glance you can just switch your phone on and see okay you know we're generating x amount of electricity we're consuming so much it just gives you so much more of a vision as to which months are better for solar generation yeah. and you can start to plan your electricity consumption so you know don't schedule your duvet washing for december yeah leave that for june yeah. when you've got a lot more solar around and it's going to cost you nothing to actually dry and clean those uh, duvets so thanks once again to heatable for sponsoring this episode if you're looking for any solar panels or battery storage yeah. definitely go check them out at heatable.co.uk so when you're doing your research for an installer, you should be looking for them to be MCS accredited. Even though that really doesn't mean an awful lot because we know that the MCS accreditation doesn't actually guarantee quality installations, but it does at least give you some sort of recourse if things go wrong 
which we actually have covered in a previous episode. So doing your, your research to begin with to find a good installer, then that moves you on to when the installer comes to your house and starts to put together a quotation, mm -hmm. that process. How should that look? So first and foremost, alarm bells should start going off if the installer doesn't start measuring each and every single room and doing a proper heat loss calculation. That is probably the most critical portion of the installation process and of the quotation process is determining the size of your house, how much heat your house actually requires, because that will allow the installer to recommend a heat pump size that will be suitable for your house. And you don't want a heat pump that's undersized or oversized. You want something that's kind of bang on for the heat losses of your house. When we had installers come through and quote us, I think we ended up in the end about six of them came through. I think there were six through. guys, yeah. Wow, it was so incredibly, insanely different each experience of meeting yeah. them. I remember there was one guy who got out of his car and he walked in with the most disinterested look on his face. He did not have a single pen or a piece of paper in his hand. Mm -hmm. He had his mobile phone, which he kept on checking for WhatsApp messages and stuff. Didn't even look at the front of the house and he just walked through the front door and then parked himself in the kitchen and just wanted to have coffees and, and chat. And that, Schmooze and have cappuccinos. We said to him, you know, which, should we show you around? Oh, no, I don't need, no, no, it's fine. Don't worry, I, I don't want to impose. I won't, no, no, don't worry. You don't have to show me around. I get Stand the idea. Send me the floor plans. And that was it. So as he's leaving, we were like, okay, so sorry, how, how are we going to get the quotation? Oh yeah, yeah, don't worry. Um, I'll send you a text message with the price and that'll, that'll be it. And I think it was like maybe two days later, mm -hmm. he sends a message. Hi Mars, um, your heat pump, you know, this, this much, cheers. That is an absolute no, 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 mm -hmm. no thank you. Homeowners should not be accepting that. And that is actually one of the good things about the MCS is that they do actually have a certain criteria for quotations. So they are requiring the installers to come out, do a proper heat loss calculation. That heat loss calculation gets put into the quotation document. So you get a very clear idea as to what the running costs are gonna be, how much electricity you're gonna more or less consume. So I would just say as a homeowner, if you're gonna be getting a installer in the door, please allocate a good hour, maybe even two hours, mm -hmm. honestly, of your time. You know, don't do it in a period where you're rushed, where the kids are running around distracting you, where you know you've got to get them to school or get them to a football match or something and you need to leave in 20 minutes and you're stressing out. You can really walk around and answer every question that that installer has because hopefully, they will have a lot of questions. They should be saying, are your windows double glazed, triple glazed? Nope, they're lead windows and they're period features. Okay, all right, good to know. Are these walls insulated? You know, maybe putting his hand on the walls to see like how cold, where the cold spots are, just to roughly kind of get an idea of your house and how cold or drafty it is, where those spots are. Asking you where your radiators are, looking at how old your radiators are, looking at, okay, do you have underfloor in this, in this room? All these things are critical components that need to be taken into consideration and by the same token this is your opportunity to grill the installer and ask your questions uh, this is something that unfortunately we don't see enough of from the homeowners i think if the homeowners were a lot more adamant about getting answers there and then yeah and that... you can do that in a nice way yeah no, you can be polite. i said grill but i mean yeah, this you... is your opportunity to get some very valuable information out of them that's precisely why we wrote bodge buster is to give people confidence to actually ask the right questions yeah because each and every single house is different there are going to be things that are going to change your central heating system quite drastically so getting the right answers for your particular property things like radiators is something that was completely glossed over in our installation yeah uh, and it's probably the most critical thing because heat pumps they are low temperature systems so if you've got the wrong heat emitters so that's underfloor heating or radiators in place even though that heat pump might be configured brilliantly, it will still not work as well as it should do. So ask the right questions. And this is your sole opportunity that you'll get with the installer to actually get these questions answered and addressed. And then I would just say, as you're wrapping up the meeting and you know, you're know you feeling good about it, one of the most key questions I would recommend you ask is then saying to him, and just to be clear, who is gonna be doing the installation? Mm -hmm. Is it you? If you know it's not him because you know he is just, uh, maybe he's a engineer, designer, something like that, and it's a big company. Is the installation team that's coming here, are they part of your company or are you outsourcing? that to a third party. You want to know the exact people that are gonna be installing the system. If a third party is coming into the mix, 
you need to know that because that should be part of your decision making process as to whether you choose them because you're then adding an entity that you do not know that you have not screened and that you don't know how reputable or qualified those people are. If it's a small business and he says, no, 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 it's my business, there's only like four or five of us. Okay, great, so will you be here on the day? Will you come at the beginning? Will you come at the end? Will you be here every day? You know, ask these questions, find out who physically is coming through your front door. I think that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge if you've hired Octopus to come and do the installation because, you know, they will have hundreds of installers now. So you're not necessarily going to know who's going to arrive. Yes, but you would then hope that Octopus have taken the onus and the responsibility on to at least train and get all of those installers on their books up to a certain level. Obviously, you won't know the exact human being that's coming through the door. When the team gets designated to me, can I please find out, you know, um, will there be a supervisor with them? Is the supervisor, and how long has he been with Octopus? You know, you can ask a few yeah. questions like that. I think that that's quite reasonable to ask that. Follow us on Instagram or drop us a message at Renewable Heating Hub. In terms of timelines, you've got to be aware that if you sign on the dotted line for your heat pump, it's not going to get installed tomorrow. That I think is, is really important yeah. to know because I actually think that there is a huge misconception there. A lot of people are under the impression that buying a heat pump is like literally buying a radiator or buying a gas boiler that you can phone the guy and go, hi, can I please have this? They'll say, yeah, no worries. And then you know, two weeks later, they book you in, they turn up, they do it. I think that people don't actually realize and they haven't been maybe exposed to just how long the process is. Because even in our case, when we did all of the research, it was still much longer than we expected. I think it's gonna vary from case to case. I mean, if you've got a, a smaller property and you're putting in a smaller heat pump, the likelihood of you waiting a shorter period of time is a lot better. But if you've got a property that's gonna require a heat pump, anything over kind of nine kilowatts, is going to require DNO approval. So DNO is, is your district network operator. It's basically the guys that are servicing the electricity in your area. So they need to ensure that the grid it's gonna be okay for that actual heat pump to work. And in addition to that, in some instances, you're gonna need planning permission under the permitted development. So if your heat pump, the actual voluminous size of the box itself exceeds a certain size, you're gonna to have to get planning permission from your council. These are all things that obviously add to the to the process. And can take weeks and months. We've got neighbors in, in our area and when they did it, it took I think nearly six months for their DNO to come through. I mean, I know it's easy to to moan and groan at absolutely everything, but a Scottish power is our DNO. On their paperwork, it says you have to give us up to six months to approve that. And they literally run that clock down to five months and two weeks. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, you are going to have to find out what the approximate waiting time is for your DNO. I know there's some DNOs in England that are a lot faster, but whatever that period is, you have to build into your waiting time yeah. because you can't pull the trigger and actually get the heat pump installed until you have that paperwork. I personally would be thinking in my mind of a timeline of six to eight months from start to finish. You know, by the time you started the process, you've got your DNO, the installer has got the units that you need, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe that accidentally pushes you into February. Well, you don't want to be doing a heat pump installation in February, right? I mean, you, that, you want to avoid that at all costs, really. So you want to then be thinking, okay, so I ideally want to be doing a heat, a heat pump you know, installation somewhere around like April would be fine. That would be great because then if we're without heating or there's any heating issues, that month is great because then we've got a few weeks to sort it out. We've got May to sort it out, but then we go into the summer so we can have some time to, you know, look at components, replace things, do whatever we need to do, tweaking. And then we go into you know the autumn and then be able to turn it back on and test it and things like that. And to also build on your points about you know not wanting to do the work in February. The reason for that is because you are going to be without heating for probably about three days. Yeah. In our case, I think it took about four days to do the job from start to finish. The central heating got turned on and off, on and off for like over a course of a mm -hmm. three week period. We were on and off all the time. Yeah. And I mean, think about your location as well. Just be sensible. Like for example, if you know you're on the Isle of Skye and you know that you know you could be expecting a lot of snow that you could get a lot of wind you are exposed in at that particular time or month a period in the year you're getting a lot of gales and storms and things think about your access you know people coming up to you people driving to you you know you don't want to necessarily be you know booking you know, installers to come with their vans and all their equipment and having to wade through you know three foot of snow and getting stuck on roads and it's just it's just not practical so you know doing it at a time in the year where it's in your location stable 
but maybe chilly. Not yeah. cold, not winter cold, but chilly would be great. But of course, there are some people that can't do that yeah. and they travel and they've got you know, other life commitments and they physically have to have it done in the middle of June. It's just all about everybody doing what works for them. And we're just talking again about the ideal situation. In our case, we had to replace the hot water cylinder with our installation because an existing hot water cylinder that you've got for a gas boiler probably isn't going to work. So if you have got a, a hot water cylinder, that is probably going to be replaced. So our job was kind of semi-invasive where in the utility room, which we, which is where we keep all of our equipment, that pretty much got gutted and the new stuff went in. We didn't change any pipe work or anything like that. That took us four days. If you were to start upgrading pipe work and radiators, you're probably going to be looking for at a least week. a week. If getting heated has become a highlight of your podcast playlist, we'd be super grateful if you could share your enthusiasm with others by leaving us a five-star review. It will help boost the visibility of the podcast and let us know that you are loving these episodes. Your support means the world to us and your feedback helps shape future episodes. So if you're enjoying our company, please take a moment to rate us highly or leave a review and let us know what makes getting heated a great listen for you. Looking back on our installation, what we should have done and what we didn't do, I should have been far more proactive in protecting our home. We didn't have too much damage. I'm not saying that we you know, got trashed, we didn't. But I think we were very lucky we didn't. I was actually, I'm quite a people pleaser with regards to that that kind of, you know, wanting the tradesmen to come in and feel comfortable, getting them teas and coffees and, you know, crisps and cakes and all those kind of things. And like, I want them to feel like they they want to be able to get on with the work. I, you know, didn't want to cover the rugs when they were walking mm. through. I was just trying not to get in the way, so to speak. I think if I do it again now, I think I'm going to be far more proactive. And even, honestly, if, if you want to do it, maybe you do it yourself the night before. I personally would take the onus upon myself to say, okay, I know they're coming tomorrow, so tonight, let's get all the furniture out the way. Personally, I would roll up the rugs or cover the rugs with a dust sheet. I would protect like little areas, like if I know they're going through a narrow corridor, I would try and protect, even just put a bit of cardboard up against the walls, you know, that kind of thing. And definitely if you know that part of the installation is that the team is going to be replacing radiators, please do yourself the favor and put a towel dust sheet or plastic down mm. underneath where those radiators are coming off and on the wall. I did not do that. And I've got two rooms now where one of them has carpet and the other one is wood, but it's still stained the wood, where when the ra radiators have been removed, kind of black liquid mm. kind of came out of the pipework. And that stuff is lethal. It stains instantly. Mm -hmm. You can't get the stains out. They're just horrible. Both, even on the wood parquet, it stained the wood parquet. Even if it's tile, like just protect your the floors. So just do it because honestly, it's worth it because when that stuff comes out of the, the pipe, it's just horrible. If you can do that, it lowers your anxiety, it protects your home, and it also makes our life a lot easier. <laughs> To have your say, join our forums at renewableheatinghub.co.uk. Also, just think about where your heat pump is actually going as well. So during the quotation stage, you should have actually had that conversation with the installer as to where should we put the, in, the heat pump outside? Whereabouts are you going to install it? Are you going to have these vibration mounts? Um, Anti-vibration mounts. Exactly. And how, if you want to screen off, if you don't like the look of it, you know, talk to them then about, okay, so what am I allowed to do? Or what would you recommend I do to screen it off to make it look more pretty and more attractive for aesthetically? When they're coming to do the installation, you need to make sure as the homeowner that that space that you've agreed that the heat pump is going to go again is a space that is clear that is accessible mars had really taken it upon himself to to really do a fantastic job so he'd made sure that the whole area that we were going to put the heat pump in was completely clear there was absolutely no obstacles in the way and um, he'd even put down the slabs the concrete slabs mm -hmm. and we knew exactly how we were going to screen it off we'd already had a full plan of action in place for that and so when the guys arrived you know the vans could easily pull up as close as they could to that spot there was a lot of thought that went into that as well so again you just want to make sure that when your installation is happening you're thinking about what's happening and the activity that's going to happen in your home 
in, for example, your boiler room or access to the, the boiler sec uh, area in your home, but also to the outside as well. Placement, as you said, is probably the most important thing at the moment, especially for air source heat pumps. Uh, one of the most contentious points about them is obviously the fan noise that comes off them. I don't typically find the fan noise to be that troublesome when I actually speak to people and see comments on forums. I think the biggest issue is the anti-vibration mounts. I just don't understand why in general heat pump manufacturers aren't just putting in anti-vibration mounts as standard because it's the vibrations that are causing reverberations through the actual building structure itself. You know, the fan outside is no louder than a microwave. And if you consider that, you know, there's walls, windows and stuff in the way, that should not be a significant amount of noise that's actually keeping you awake at night. Yeah. I think it's just those reverberations that are actually coming through the house and actually creating that noise, which is keeping people awake. Yeah, I think it's definitely worth asking, uh, making sure it's on your quotation if you if you need it. Just certainly discussing it with the installer at the quotation stage is your anti-vibration mounts and whether he's going to be using them. Again, the positioning of the heat pump where it's going to be outside, etc. But making sure that that's all taken into consideration in the design and quotation process, and that when they arrive, they're taken out of the van and they're definitely going to be used, um, and they're not going to be forgotten about because you do not want to get to the stage where your heat pump has been installed and you know everything's happening and they're about to say goodbye and they're giving you the final walkthrough and you walk around the corner at the side of the house and you go oh fantastic and so those are the anti-vibration uh mounts, yeah. mounts and the guys go what no we didn't bring those we didn't use those make sure again have a little checklist you know with you um as per your quotation or just have the quotation printed out yeah. and you know check it off you know when the guys get there that first day say so okay guys so this is what we're installing this is what you know you've quoted me for i know it sounds silly but you know if it says on your quotation valent i know it sounds ridiculous but go outside yeah. and make sure that a valent has come out of the back of a van and not a Mitsubishi. People make accidents completely genuinely. They don't often load the vans themselves. So somebody might've just loaded the wrong heat pump for the wrong property. It does happen. So please make sure that you do your due diligence from your side as the homeowner. You're listening to the Getting Heated podcast with Kirsten and Mars. Yeah, and then I think that, you know, you've had them there for a number of days. They've done the installation. You have done your checklist. You know you for everything that you have been quoted for and paid for has been installed. Make sure, again, that just like you did when you had the quotation meeting with them, that you carve out of your day. You, you know, they say to you, okay, oh, we're going to be out of here. Um, John, we're finishing up at two o'clock on Thursday. We're hoping to leave by then. Make sure that either yourself or your partner can be there to have a proper and thorough handover. Right, can you take me to the control panel? Can you show me how it works? Can you, how do I turn it on? How do I turn it off? What are the most common troubleshooting errors I'm probably going to get with this with this control because mm -hmm. he'll know and he'll say oh gosh you're probably going to get error 66 is probably going to come up and that mm. means blah 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 right so how do I clear that error and how do I fix it that's not going to help help you 100% of the time but it sure as cakes is going to help you on some situations and you are going to be grateful you've done it so definitely a really good handover it's really disappointing to see that handovers are becoming less detailed because we're beginning to see a lot more of that on the forums it's almost like the heating engineers are saying look the system's in place you don't worry about it you know it's, it's very complicated the control panel is complicated that unfortunately is not the right way forward because you understanding the basics of the controller are very important as kirsten said because there are certain elements of that that are going to become very important, especially if you get an alarm at three o'clock in the morning, you know, there's no way the installer is going to pick up the phone at three at three a.m. So if you know that this error code is to do with the flow and, and how to override that so that at least it turns it off or how to turn the actual system off in general is just something that's very, very important to do. Gosh, I remember when ours went out on Boxing mm -hmm. Night, was it? Boxing Day, yeah. Boxing Day night. And I mean, it was just, oh my God. We, we literally were without heating until, until the new year, weren't we? We had no central heating. It was just an absolute fiasco. So the, so the issue with our system on Boxing Day, as you'd mentioned, was actually the water filter. And that was something that I was going to cover as the next point, because that is probably the most important thing that you ask the installers where the filter is gone. It's usually a Y strainer. So it's basically a little Y um, shaped pipe that comes off your main pipe work. Inside there's a little gauze filter and that typically fills up with 
kind of the little corrosive and gunky bits that actually are present like, in most heating systems. Yeah, it looks like sediment. It looks like little yeah. granules, like almost like tea bag kind of metal granules. It looks very innocuous when you actually clean it out, but it, it's remarkable how this actually causes the actual flow errors to happen. So that is probably the most important thing to figure out where that is because in 95% of cases that we've seen people reporting flow errors, it's because their actual filter and strainer was dirty. Mm. So there are two steps to actually remedy that. One is to know how to turn your system off because you can't open your pipework once it's flowing, obviously. So you need to know how to turn it off, where it is, how to open it, how to clean it, and how to put it back on, and then how to turn the system back on. Mm -hmm. And that will, in 95% of instances, clear most flow errors. So, you know, that is a very important part of your the handover hand to actually understand how to do that. Yeah. You're listening to the Getting Heated podcast with Kirsten and Mars. And then the other thing that we see time and time again, and this is something that happened to us, is that the installers did not enable weather compensation on the heat pump. Weather compensation is just a must have because it's by far the most efficient way of running your, uh, your air source heat pump. In our case, our installers told us, no, 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 your, your model's not capable enough of actually running the way that we've actually set it up. It won't work with weather compensation. So we believed them for the first two years. It was only after fiddling and when we got more confidence with our actual system that we started to tamper around with certain things. And I was going through the menu one day and I came across a thing saying, you know, weather compensation, do you want to enable the uh, the actual weather compensation curve? I did. And lo and behold, weather compensation does work. The reason why installers don't like to enable weather compensation is because when weather compensation is enabled, your actual radiators feel cool to the touch. They don't feel warm. So by them just configuring a system to run at 45 degrees flat out all the time, your radiators will feel warm to the touch. When weather compensation is running, on, you know, when, it, when it's cold outside, those rads will come up to 40, 42, 43, 45 degrees. But when it's mild outside, those rads will drop down to 35 degrees. So when, you know, our skin and our bodies run at 36 degrees, when you actually touch them, they feel like cool, cool, but they're not cool because they're still a lot warmer than the actual room. And they are actually heating those rooms just a lot more efficiently. So make sure 100 percent and actually get the installer to show you on the control panel that they have enabled weather compensation and then you'll know that it's 100% turned on. And just be aware that your radiators will be a bit cooler to the touch, but I guarantee you that it does work and they do heat rooms. And the last thing that I would ask the installer as part of the handover is to show them where the monitoring is on the actual system. Mm -hmm. A lot of controllers do have this. Sometimes it's a hidden menu that basically tells you how much electricity your heat pump is consuming and how much heat it's generating. It's not often visible. In our case, it's all hidden behind a, a password section, which the, the installers gave to us. In a lot of systems, it is actually available just on the actual menu itself. It's just a very helpful metric for you to know whether your system is working as efficiently as it should, because you'll be able to work out your coefficient of performance, the COP, to know that, okay, you know, my heat pump's running at three, 3.54, whatever it is, it's running pretty well. The flip side of that point, if it's running at two, you know, you've got problems with your system. So just having access to that information and monitoring is very important. Don't ask us what our COP is. We're not discussing it. <laughs> ask us in a few months. Ask us after Brendan's come. Yes. And then we'll tell you. <laughs> also, if you're quite adventurous and you're a little bit geeky, there are third-party monitoring things that you can actually add to your system. You might want to look into some of those because they'll give you far higher amounts of data than, you know, a standard controller would do. So, you know, if that's something that floats your boat, there's definitely a lot of options out there right now that will give you access to loads and loads of data. And then I think just as the installer is finally walking out the door and you've had your hand over, you know, figure out what your future relationship is going to be like with him, mm -hmm. you know, him or her. Is it going to be a, a service situation? Are you paying a subscription? Are you paying an annual membership? Are they going to come back every year and do some kind of servicing on your system? You know, you don't want to say goodbye and <laughs> that person disappears into the ether and then you don't know who to call when that something goes wrong and you feel very nervous and you feel very alone. You want to make sure that you still feel like you have a rope to hold on to after that person has left, that installer has left. If something doesn't go wrong and you have a flawless system, brilliant. What are you going to do about just servicing and things like that? So, you know, just think through the whole long-term relationship as well and the after sales, you know, care and all those kind of things that, you know, what your plan is going to be. That's actually a great point because there's a little bit of fine print in almost all of these service contracts is that if you do not get your heat pump serviced once a year, 
this could actually void the warranty of your heat pump. Sign off with them to do some sort of maintenance contract. I know that there's some people that have actually used installers where they've signed over 10 years. So they basically paid them for 10 years up front. Wow. They got a really good deal for that. Wow. That covers components, that covers uh, all kinds of potential maintenance issues, which is a, a good deal. Obviously, you run the risk of that installer going bust and, you know, I was going to say, that. yeah. But there's also a lot of installers that are charging a lot of money to come and do the servicing. We've seen some cases down towards London. I don't know whether this is London pricing, but, you know, 500 pounds just to come out and do the maintenance of, a, of an air source heat pump machine, which, to be quite honest, yeah, is probably like ridiculous. an hour's work. But it is something that you do have to figure out because you do have to get them maintained in order to not let your warranty get voided. <laughs> us on Instagram or drop us a message at Renewable Heating Hub. So I think that that's pretty much what an ideal heat pump installation should look like from start to finish. I would just caveat everything with heat pumps with the fact that they are incredible. There's so many nuances to anything with a heat pump in the fact that everything has to be taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. Your home, your location, uh, the way that your home is positioned, your windows, your insulation, your radiators, underfloor heating. There is so, so many variables from house to house where even though we're talking about an ideal heat pump installation, again, it's just kind of almost like a framework everybody's installation will be entirely different, mm -hmm. entirely different. Even if you use the same installer, even if you use the same heat pump and you've, you know, you've chosen, you know, mm -hmm. a brand and your next door neighbor's chosen a brand, you will have very, very different experiences. And therefore your end result and your outcome can be hugely different. And the biggest tip that I can give is try and educate yourself as much about heat pumps as possible. It's obviously very difficult to do if you've never had a heat pump before, which is why I always recommend that people go to the Renewable Heating Hub forums. I don't think there's any homeowner that realistically would want to go into a heat pump installation and deliberately hope for an awful outcome. <laughs> no, everybody wants to have a good outcome. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you'd like to think that installers, they don't want the headache of, of unhappy, stressed out customers phoning them afterwards, complaining, threatening them, being, you know, shouting down the phone saying, my, my heat pump doesn't work, my heating's a nightmare. So ultimately, installers want you to have a good outcome as well. I think that the key is that we as homeowners have to work alongside envision ourselves working alongside the installer to get to a good outcome i think that we can't remove ourselves mm. from the equation because i think it's when homeowners go in with an idea of like oh i'll just order a heat pump like i've ordered a front door and i'll get it installed by a handyman that's when everything can really unravel and go wrong very quickly and the homeowner can really feel out of their depth very, very quickly. That just leads to really, really bad situations. So that's a wrap for this particular episode. Wow. Thank you once again to Heatable for sponsoring this episode. Thank you, Heatable. Uh, if you are considering solar panels, definitely check Heatable out. Or solar batteries. Or batteries. Yeah. They work fantastically well with heat pump systems. They really do. I think personally they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And I think that you know nearly all homes should have solar. I, I'm a big advocate for solar. Yeah. I think it's fantastic. And yeah, if you're having a heat pump or think about having a heat pump installed, I would automatically, if your budget can stretch and if you mm -hmm. can you know, financially afford it, I would definitely think about putting those two things in if you don't have solar already because solar battery and heat pump that's really going to set you up marriage made in heaven yeah <laughs> so thanks very much for listening i hope you have a great day i hope you are nice and warm and comfortable wherever you are and we will see you in the next episode of getting heated Bye.